Mini episode 566 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.info. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge. Mini episode number 566. This is FDH managing partner Rick Morris, and we're going to have two fine folks coming on to talk politics with us today. One is a gentleman that we've had on a number of times. Uh, I would say our favorite recurring guest for uh, talking politics. Uh, we have two, I guess, if you include politics and public policy. Uh, Joe Diaguardi, I, I tend to think of him more along the public policy realm, so not to snub him when I say our favorite politics guest, but uh, in terms of pure politics, and you can find it, of course, at epolitics.com, where he is the proprietor. Colin Delaney, who's been on with us a bunch of times to talk politics, and today, specifically, we are looking at the state of the Republican Party heading into the 2016 presidential race. Also joining us today, one of our regular FDH Lounge dignitaries, uh, a member of the, uh, the cast, one of our very, very most versatile guys for coming on and talking any subjects. We've had him on to talk any number of different things over a period of time. This is, I believe, I'm almost certain, the first time we've ever had him on in a segment that is completely devoted to politics, a New York area journalist for Queens Chronicle, Good Times Magazine, and a number of other uh, fine publications, and uh, one of the dwindling, dwindling band of self-professed Rockefeller Republicans, our good friend Lloyd Carroll. But uh, first, we'll bring on the phone lines the aforementioned Colin Delaney from ePolitics, uh, a good friend of the show over a period of time, somebody I always enjoy mixing it up with. Colin, nice to have you on again, my man. How are you today? I'm doing great, Rick. It's a pleasure to be with you. Favorite recurring politics guest? That is a high honor, sir. I'm happy to accept Absolutely. It. <laughs> it, it's uh, in, in candor. It's not a long list. We've tended to stick with you. We've never <laughs> been some others, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's not a it's not a long list because we tend to keep coming back to you. But there's a reason we keep coming back to you, and uh, there are very uh, enjoyable uh, segments here. Uh, we, we we have a man left of center in yourself. We have a man in myself who uh, at this point in time I, I always said uh, paleocon previously, but now I have a more specific descriptor. I would say a Rand Paul Republican, and uh, joining us again, as I mentioned, one of our uh, uh, members of our uh, FDH Lounge uh, re- recurring family here of uh, contributors, uh, White Carroll, who is a Rockefeller Republican. So uh, Indeed, Lloyd, I am in the Smithsonian. I will be on exhibit from now through November 2016. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Stop you and mount you. <laughs> hey, why don't we why don't we just start off on that note with a complete irrelevancy? Sure. Uh, the uh, the joining of the Republican presidential race of George Pataki. I don't figure that's worth more George than a minute or two. George did it because he knew we were doing the segment today, and he timed it for that reason. <laughs> yes, he did. I mean, he probably comes about as close as anybody in this field. The fact that he is calling for ground troops uh, in, in Iraq. It's one of these things where I know that, again, he is also Lloyd coming off as overall one of the biggest moderates in the field and one of the few who would not shirk from that. But uh, as a paleocon, uh, I, I have always laughed at the, uh, the joke that was made. I don't remember who first, whether it was Sam Francis or whoever first coined it, but uh, everything is negotiable except permanent war. So if you're George Pataki, you can get out there and be squishy on the social issues and this and that and whatever. But if you're in favor of endless war in the Middle East, I guess that's supposed to cover your right flank, is it not? I have a feeling that's probably it. And, uh, you know, because as you just said it best, kind of this squishy rhino thing. So you got to look tough in something. I'm not sure Pataki himself really <laughs> believes that. But, you know, this way maybe John McCain will come out, shake his hand, uh, give him the bona fide so he can go into South Carolina and, and other places, not be laughed off the stage. I, I think this is just um, – 
PR. I, I don't think he really believes it. That's the that's the funny thing. And I like George. I think he's. A, I've met him numerous times. On a personal level, I like him. I'm not. I mean, look, we know he's not going to be president, but he does. Yeah, if he can do what Giuliani should have done eight years ago, this could make things a little more interesting. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, in terms of looking at it, Colin, really there's probably not a whole lot of difference on the spectrum, uh, I guess social issues aside, if you look at uh, going back to last decade, him and the George W. Bush presidency. He was always pretty tight with the Bush administration, especially post-9-11 and you, you, you've got a, a landscape now where, and, and again, folks like myself, I think, would say that it's a very good thing, but people who we tend to think of as creatures of that time, Jeb Bush among them, I mean, John Boehner wanted uh, Jeb Bush to run for president, pushed him to, because to John Boehner, the George W. Bush presidency is something to be nostalgic about. So, Colin, the fact that these figures are getting marginalized right now, what does that tell us about where the Republican Party uh, stands post-W uh, and any kind of reckoning that might be there? Yeah, it's hard to know where they stand because, you know, from an outsider's point of view, you know, it looks like it's hard to see who stands out in any way. I mean, individual people have their own niches. You know, Rand Paul is carving out the anti-surveillance uh, pro, you know, freedom when it comes to, to pot and that kind of thing. But, you know, on, on economic policies, you know, name me one of them that doesn't want to cut taxes on the rich and cut regulations on business. From an outsider's point of view, the, the difference seems to be more uh, in terms of personality than in terms of their actual politics. And it's really hard to see who stands out in any way. I mean, obviously, Jeb Bush has a certain amount of heft that most of the others don't. But it's also hard to see him getting past uh, a lot of primary states. Well, and, and that's a very interesting question, too, on tax policy. And, and, and I want to pivot to you. Uh, Lloyd, with the, uh, sure. the bona fides of, of, of a, a CPA here on this. This is one of the things that I said during the last election, and, and it might be surprising coming from an avowed right-winger like myself, but I have always said that, to me, the Laffer curve is obviously true. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just so obvious, but it's a matter of where are we on the curve. Nobody asks that question. And the fact that, uh, again, Obama pushed through the tax hike on the upper income folks, which, again, well, letting the Bush tax cuts expire, whatever you want to call it, tax hike sure. tax, uh, cut expiration. And, and that, again, we don't appear to have suffered in, in terms of that, the deficit is coming down at this point in time, a, a, as they did in the uh, in the 90s. I think there were other reasons in the 90s, technological sure. advancements, whatnot. But in terms of where we're going from here, does, does that say anything uh, in, in terms of uh, the tax policy for the Republican field? Anything they might take note of? Well, a, that, that, that is the, the $64,000 question. Uh, what's Interesting. We've actually heard Republicans talk about income inequality. It's not just been uh, the Hillary Clintons waving that banner. So it's become a popular buzz phrase for both parties. Uh, I think the days look. Uh, to be fair to George W. Bush, uh, I, I I think he was a good guy with just bad advisors. And the idea of going to war and cutting taxes, I think even the biggest Democrat hating uh, Republican cheerleader would say that's probably not the best way to go. And, and, right. things, and I think Republicans are being a lot more prudent on this, that you can't have guns and butter. So it's going to be uh, an interesting trade-off to see what happens. Who's going to be courageous enough to say, listen, we just can't keep cutting taxes. We, there's always going to be some government spending we have to spend for the military, whether we like it or not. Just the way the world is, we've got to be prepared. Uh, so it's going to see, we're going to have to find out who the adults are in the room when uh, the debates start. Yeah, I mean, if, if someone's an adult in the room, but the primary voters have been basically fed a line for 20, 30, 40 years that raising taxes is always bad. I mean, Reagan raised taxes. Sure you, you want to talk about the Laffer curve? Yeah, the Laffer curve works if you're at 98% tax rate. Anything below that and cutting taxes cuts your revenue. It has been demonstrated. It was demonstrated in the Reagan years. They cut taxes, I think, in 82 and had to raise them again uh, two, four, uh, four years later. Because it turns out if you cut taxes, you bring in less money. The Laffer curve may look cool, but it simply doesn't work. Again, unless you're at about a 95, 98% tax rate. Like, you know, Kennedy brought down taxes on the super rich when they were, I think, at a, a rate of about 70 or 80%. And that probably made sense at the time. But, um, you know, when the, the, the marginal tax rate for an upper income person is more like you know, 30 odd, 40%. 
you know, it's hard to see how cutting taxes raises more money. Well, and that's the thing, though, Colin, in terms of rhetoric versus reality, because, again, I consider myself a supply sider, but it's all a matter of I, I think we all have to agree that, that if we strip aside the rhetoric, yes, there's a tipping point. The question is where there is. I mean, you said a second ago here right. somewhere in the 90s. I, I think it's significantly lower than that, but I think it has been proven uh, you know, twice now probably that it's not anywhere in the 30s because it has been. Right. And, and there are other cases to be made against it as well. There are moral cases to be made against bigger government, and, and I subscribe mm-hmm. to all of those. But purely as a right. matter of fiscal policy and raising the money, uh, there is a, a, a tipping point. I mean, you, are, you don't really think the tipping point is in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, do you? But when you say the tipping point. Uh, well, in, in then, terms yeah. of. Where it will start to stimulate enough growth to not just cover the cut but bring in more money? Oh, I would, yeah, I would say it is. I mean, again, we've never we've never tested it at that right? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it, theory, theory is wonderful. It's really cool to have around. But what matters is what happens in the real world. And in the sure. real world, we're not in the 70 or 80 percent tax rate. Sure. No, we, we used to be, and I think that's why shelters, I, I think, really, really predominated uh, mm-hmm. a, a lot decades ago, and that had something to do with offsetting it, but not completely. But, uh, yeah, this is this is a field, as you guys said, where guys are, are struggling to sort of carve out niches, and uh, niches uh, are, are being done a lot of times on uh, personality right now, it sort of seems like. Jeb Bush going for kind of the calm, soothing personality, uh, Ted Cruz, the firebrand, uh, I, I think, and again, I, I don't think this is just my bias, but I think in terms of, you know, issues and of standing out, I think mm-hmm. Rand Paul substantively does stand out from the field. But uh, I'll start with you on this one, uh, Colin, because another one in there would be uh, Chris Christie. I mean, that, that's a man who seems mm-hmm. to be running largely on temperament, and it doesn't seem to be getting him anywhere. So does that say anything about how the, 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 the landscape's changed in the last couple of years, that that's a guy you always thought when the future came – he would be one of the prime candidates. Maybe some of that has to do with reality on the ground. Things have gotten worse in New Jersey the last couple of years. Well, what sort of accounts for how somebody like him has gotten squeezed out the last year or so? Well, we have to separate out, you know, sort of the, the systemic effects, right, that, you know, whether the party has moved to the right and, you know, significantly versus mm-hmm. Christy, being a, Christy being a jerk <laughs> and not being liked <laughs> in New Jersey. And not coming across well. I mean, personality does definitely matter in these kind of things. Um, actually, if you want to talk um, some numbers, uh, today the Graduate School of Political Management over at GW University came out with some uh, online monitoring numbers on the different candidates who've launched so far. And one thing that was really interesting was that before Rand Paul's launch, the discussion about him was very positive. After his launch, it swung the other direction. For Marco Rubio, it was negative before and negative after. For Ben Carson, it was positive before. For Carly Fiorina, positive before, and then it dropped slightly afterwards. For Mike Huckabee, again, very positive before he launched, and then it plummets thereafter. Very interesting effect. Bernie Sanders, very little response when he first launched, but then it swung positive over the next few days. So kind of fascinating to, to watch these uh, – What's the reactions that people have? Um, and if you want to see the numbers, I've got them over at epolitics.com, and then I link over to the raw sources over at, the, uh, at GW University. So this is another thing, you know, we have, you know, we're used to looking at polling and um, uh, focus groups and things like that to understand what people are saying. But now, you know, over the last few years, the social monitoring has gotten more sophisticated. The sentiment analysis is more sophisticated. And we can start to look at the online conversation, too, which, of course, isn't representative of the general public. It's more representative of activists. But uh, still, the results can be quite striking. Great call. I hope people go check that out at epolitics.com and uh, click on the uh, the data that's linked there. Great uh, uh, point of mentioning that. Uh, Lloyd? Your thoughts yep. on this as far as uh, some of these uh, candidates here, uh, again, you're, you're pretty close geographically uh, to the uh, Chris Christie situation. You're in the same, you know, predominant media market to get a lot of this kind of stuff. So, well, he's, yeah. I think, uh, I uh, think Chris a microcosm of the field. Uh, the vibe I get from Chris Christie, and I'm going to put this in entertainment terms, it reminds me of kind of Morton Downey Jr. If you remember his uh-huh. talk show, hottest thing, and then just flamed out. Uh, that's the kind of person that Christie has. It's very entertaining. It can last a term or two. And then 
the cracks start showing. Uh, he starts thinking he's invincible. Uh, and I'm not even going to go into the Bridgegate thing, but that's probably was the beginning and the end, just in terms of, uh, I guess, the way uh, people perceived him as being invincible, arrogant, et cetera. Uh, he's an interesting guy, an entertaining guy, but I think the, the star kind of rose and fell too quickly. Uh, the one area, that's why George Pataki, by the way, is in the race. It's that Christie flame out that Pataki said, hey, I have an opening here to at least get my, to get my name out there. It's good PR for me. Uh, hey, if nothing else, he'll be able to boost some speaking engagements out of all this. So mm-hmm. I, I think this is actually brilliant marketing on, on Pataki's part. And if Pataki's smart, he might actually pick up on an area that very few Republicans have hit upon. Uh, if you remember, which president was uh, created our U.S. highway system? President Eisenhower. Our infrastructure mm-hmm. is struggling. And if you're mm-hmm. going to talk about taxes and, and the one part of government spending that Republicans, I think, could agree upon, it's fixing our infrastructure. For this company, to, for our, this country to be great, that means the highways, it means bridges, and even mass transit to make ourselves more energy independent. So this will be an interesting uh, idea to see if any Republicans will pick up on being the infrastructure kings. Well, a a two-part follow-up question here. They're actually unrelated. But the first one is on what you said. Did Christie miss his moment? Was 2012 uh, the the right moment for him because of that wearing effect that he has? Because I think that's the case. And number two, I think that was the case. Mario Cuomo had that effect in 1988 Mm -hmm. when he didn't run. There's that moment in time you either grab it Mm -hmm. or you don't. And I think that's exactly what happened. Exactly. Uh, The other thing I want to ask you is uh, you being there in New York, what was Pataki's record on infrastructure? Is this something he could run on big? Was was there a big program of uh, you know what? Roads to be deterrent? fair, no, he was more of an environmental guy, which may have actually worked against the infrastructure. However, it, to, in his defense, we have a bridge, uh, the Tappan Zee Bridge, which connects kind of Westchester and Rockland, very important for the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area, where he did push to get a new bridge built. It's been a long, it's like the Second Avenue subway. It, it goes, it kind of takes on lore of its own, but uh, I think he has something where he could make that argument. But so, if it's not him, someone's going to have to do that. Just as, as Colin pointed out, the days we just said, cut taxes, cut taxes, down with government spending, I think people are a little more sophisticated. It's not just bl- giving government a blank check, but being Republicans means being responsible, responsible spending. And I think that's where the electorate is going in 2016. I would agree with that. Uh, as far as uh, where the electorate is in the Republican Party, uh, I'll, I'll start with you on this one, Colin. To, to me, and I think to most people out there, the biggest schism that there is is, of course, the uh, the establishment versus the uh, the hardcore <laughs> activist crowd and uh To to me, the most fascinating part of the race is the people trying to straddle it. Uh, In a sense, personality-wise, if not on issues, Rand Paul was trying to do that, I think, by carrying as much water for Mitch McConnell as he did in 2014, which on a personal level sickened me, but on a uh, political level, I was glad he did it because I knew what he was doing. That now seems to be coming apart with them squaring off over the Patriot Act. But in terms of Mm -hmm. substantively trying to have a foot in each camp, of the major candidates the ones people talk about are Marco Rubio, Scott Walker. You start going down the list uh, beyond the major candidates. People talk of John Kasich trying to do it. I can tell you from Ohio that won't work because he's not a real conservative. Carly Fiorina is somebody people talk about as far as trying to bridge that. But what are your thoughts on this, uh, Colin? It's my sense in looking at this, really, that the center is not going to hold. You're, you're either going to have an establishment candidate shoved down our throats yet again, which I optimistically think will not happen this time, or you're going to have somebody uh, rising up from one of the more pure sort of bases in the Republican Party. How do you see it? That's a great question. Um, It really does seem like you're talking about two different political parties in a way when you talk about the hardcore Mm -hmm. activists, um, the Tea Party folks. And, you know, the Tea Party schisms itself into people who lean more libertarian and people who uh, are more interested in the moral issues. Um, you know, and, and from again, from a, a Democrat's point of view, from an outsider's point of view, it's almost like reaping the wind after you've sown the whirlwind, right? Or, or reaping the whirlwind after you've sown the wind. That if you tell people for 20 or 30 years on end that government is the enemy, that government spending is always bad, um, even when it comes to things like infrastructure, then it's really hard to get them to turn around and vote for a candidate who's going to do the things that we actually do to have to govern. I think that's one reason that John Boehner is in such a difficult position in the House, trying to govern what is 
essentially an ungovernable uh, majority because it's not a majority. It's a series of minorities that happen to wear the same label. Um, and then when you get down into the Republican electoral process, you've got to look at the difference between, say, a caucus state and a primary state. Um, and, a, you know, if you look at Virginia in um, 2013, the caucus system pushed the party further right than a primary probably would have done. Uh, lieutenant governor, you know, a candidate for lieutenant governor that was way out there that almost certainly wouldn't have won in a primary, but fired up the room in a caucus full of the true believers. So, um, you know, a primary I think is going to favor these. Um, and you know, I'm getting kind of mechanical and mechanistic here, but a primary system is going to favor the the more mainstream traditional candidates. You know, Carly Fiorino, but potentially if she catches on in some way. Um, where uh, the caucus states, you know, you can see a Cruz or a, a, a Rand Paul, someone who can fire up, uh, you know, it's basically the, are you going to motivate a minority to come out for you really strong, or can you build a broader coalition? And, again, it's hard to see how that coalition comes together. Well, quick, quick follow-up on, on that, uh, Colin. One of my senses is, in a lot of these states, and I think particularly early on, look at Iowa last time. Which is that, that was pretty much a joke field. I, I would I would say top to bottom, quite frankly. There, there there's there's not really anybody in that field uh, that was qualified to be president, and yet it still just took a tiny splinter to get over the top in Iowa. It got a little bit you know harder as you went along, and candidates started dropping out. But in a more substantive field this time around, isn't past prologue in terms of looking at uh, hey, if I can just cobble out twenty two point five percent, that might be enough. Um, that's a very good question. I'm sorry, I have a little background noise here. Um, the, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, I want to point to the role of outside money because that's going to mm-hmm. make a huge difference. You know, um, in the last few cycles, um, you know, once you get past New, Iowa and New, uh, New Hampshire, you know, the field winnows down really, really quickly. But you look back to the last time, uh, the 2012. Uh, you know, basically one financier kept Newt Gingrich in the race all the way through South Carolina, right? Yep. Um, the Koch brothers are, are already saying that, they, you know, they're, they're likely spending a billion dollars. And, you know, one thing that we, we might want to talk about is the rise of this kind of independent uh, political <sighs> force on the right. They're going to spend a billion dollars. They're building up a massive data infrastructure. They're building up a grassroots infrastructure, and then they're going to fund individual <laughs> candidates. They may keep people – you know, big donors like them who are giving to super PACs may keep people in the race far longer than they otherwise would have stayed. So it could be a tumultuous, you know, uh, field way later than we're used to, which in some ways I think is healthy for democracy in a way. I don't like the way it winnows down to just one or two people um, almost immediately now. <clears throat> I agree completely. Uh, Lloyd, I want to get your thoughts on this as far as uh, – I, again, trying to bridge that divide in the Republican Party. I know from having talked to you off air, you've said to me some of the same things that Colin just did. So I think we're all in broad agreement uh, about the, uh, the the nature of trying to please certain constituencies and the difficulties uh, inherent in that. The, the, the guys like Walker and Rubio that are trying to be the fusion candidates, are, are, are they biting off too, more than they can chew by trying to do that? Or, or is that ultimately, you think, going to be the path? Well, yeah, it, it, it's funny. I think Rubio is not as well known here in the East, and the fact that he is Hispanic certainly is a big plus. Walker is going to have the stigma of fighting unions and labor, and that may not, even though the unions and labor don't have the power they once did, you know, what worked in Wisconsin may not work nationally, and that could be an albatross. Um, what, and the other question is how badly, like, Rick, we, we, we're sports guys, so. The question is, if you look at this like a sports team, you've got to say, how badly do you want to win? Do you want to be right, or do you want to win? And that's a big issue for Republicans. We've never really answered that question properly. And that's now after eight years of Obama, maybe we should start thinking about winning instead of just being right. And are we willing to do that? I'll give an example. If the idea would, would have been uh, heresy, four, eight years ago, four years ago even, gay marriage. If suddenly the Republican Party, you know, I think most of America says we don't care. Whoever two people do in private, that's fine. It's their. We become libertarian in that regard. But if we start going to the old, you know, religious base, and that becomes a big topic. We are going to cut our throats. And if it becomes uh, where the candidates are just saying me too, me too, me too, we're going to cut our throats. So are we in step with America, or are we not? On the 
And if we're going to let the small issues dictate the big issues, we're in trouble. Well, Lloyd, you, you actually, I, I want to turn to you for this next one because you anticipated two points that I wanted to go to here. Sure. Uh, and, and they both surround Rand Paul. First of all, on the thing of being sports guys, again, I, I am going to work to be uh, objective in, in setting up my point of view on this because in a couple days I'm doing an NBA Finals preview on the show, and if I can be objective about my Cleveland Cavaliers uh, as I'm doing that, I can be objective about discussing Rand Paul. But Absolutely. In terms of, By the way, who do you predict? Do you think the, that Cleveland will beat Golden State? What's your prediction on this, Rick? I don't have one yet, but my gut says Golden State in seven, which I don't like. But uh, okay, you know. all right. Well, that shows you can be fair enough. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's my that's my gut feeling. I I truly hope I'm wrong. But on Rand Paul, I actually have a slight tad more optimism. And, and here's how I want to set that up. And the reason I want to start with you is because you're always talking, Boyd, whenever you and I talk politics off air about this thing from your perspective as a Northeast Republican and the areas where people don't agree with Republicans, and as you just referenced there, Rand Paul is the one guy out there, I don't think anybody can deny or dispute this, who's trying to build a new coalition for 2016, who, who's no trying question. to bring people in and who's trying to do that. So I have optimism from that point of view because it's a formula that's different than the ones I think that have been proven to fail. So what, what are your thoughts about him being able to attract people? I think he's done a good job. Let me give you. I think he's done a great job. For example, I've watched Bill Maher, who's not exactly a place where Republicans want to go, and you can see these guys really like each other, and that's great because mm -hmm. you know Maher comes off as the stone or whatever, but he has a very big audience, and even he said, "Hey, you know what? This is a guy worth looking at." That is exactly the point you're making. Now, I'm not sure how libertarian I, – I don't know that much about Paul, for example, how he feels on gay marriage. I don't know if that – is he a pure libertarian that way, or does suddenly the libertarian break no. you know, hit the skids on this? I don't know. Uh, he's saying but states' it, it rights. He's saying what the state case. society. Yeah, I mean, he's, he, he's, he's saying what – he is trying to be acceptable to the social conservatives. Uh, he's saying what the states decide. Look, I'm a social conservative, but I think what he's got to say on it is, is, is realistic in this climate. You're not going to be able to get any kind of federal deal to go down. He'd prefer that states do it, but this doesn't look like anything he's going to spend a lot of his time on as president. Sure. Okay. I would. I would. So that, you may have to give lip service to the base on you know to the conservative base. I get that. Yeah, and and that's because again they're, 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 they do have the veto power uh, in this party, and he does not want to be vetoed uh, by them. Your sense of it, Colin, uh, as somebody who was uh, left of center and who was uh, eyeing him as a potential uh, general election uh, candidate, uh, as somebody who advocates for Democrat candidates, how uh, frightened are you of this guy potentially being able to cut into the base and be able to uh, to run against, let's say, Hillary, for, you know, since she seems to be the strong front runner, based on the last eight years and in ways that can hurt her? Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting. He does have the potential – to create, you know, a new coalition in the sense that he can, you know, to some extent, depending on where he goes and how strong he goes for gay marriage, that kind of thing, potentially peel off some younger voters. But when you look at younger voters, they're also typically, you know, <laughs> the, the studies that I've seen recently have suggested that they're still in favor of a strong social safety net, things that a good libertarian is not going to be pushing for. You know, another one that people do point to is Rubio with the potential to peel off uh, Latino voters. Um, the big question there is ethnic identity more important than policy, right? You know, are you mm -hmm. simply going to vote for somebody because he shares, you know, a common cultural background with you in some ways? You know, uh, uh, a Cuban, you know, Cuban American uh, culture, Cuban American society, very different from, say, Mexican American society in Texas. You know, I come from Texas. And Latino culture in Texas breaks down along about eight or ten different lines, depending on where you're from and how many generations your family's been in the country. So, you know, uh, a lot of outsiders will want to say there is, you know, he will peel off Latino vo voters, but we don't know until it actually, you know, gets down to the, to, to the part where people vote. Um, people, Republicans are going to have to assemble something resembling a new coalition, simply because the percentage of white voters is dropping by a percentage, you know, a point or two with every election. If um, Romney had had the same electorate as George W. Bush in 2010 and had turned out at the, at the rates they did in 2012, he would have won. But the percentage of white voters had declined by that few percent as the country becomes more diverse. 
Um, honestly, I just have a hard time seeing any of them beat Hillary Clinton. I mean, there's a, I, I, I think that Hillary Clinton is going to peel off. There are a lot of women in this country who are kind of tired of men telling them what to do, and many of them are Republicans, you know, just as many of them are Democrats. And a lot of them are going to say, here is a woman who has, you know, put up with a man who did not treat her as well as he should, and yet she has, uh, you know, built her own life, built her own career, built her own success, that she's someone to admire and to want to, to support. I suspect that she'll pull off, peel off a lot more Republican women voters than people suspect. Well, let, let me just ask you, though, because – it is this country, for whatever reason, and I almost kind of think it's more mystic and unexplainable than anything else when you look at it, because this this goes back decades and decades and decades. Two terms, one party, two terms, the other party. Two terms, two terms, mm-hmm. two terms. You know, let's just say, I think even you would agree, Barack Obama is not bequeathing America circa 1988 to his successor as George, uh, as, uh, George H.W. Bush inherited Ronald Reagan's America. It, it, it took something like that and Ronald Reagan's supreme popularity at the time to push a very dull George H.W. Bush over the top. So given mm-hmm. that she's working against that and given that, again, you know, you're not going to have you know, all of the Obama coalition at your uh, disposal because, quite frankly, she's not black and that was part of the supercharging of the turnout, uh, how, how do you see it working in light of that two-term curse, essentially? Well, um, we had uh, four terms of FDR followed by a term of Truman. You know, we had three mm-hmm. terms of, Ra- you know, two terms of Reagan followed by a term of Bush. You know, we're not talking about a very big data set. We don't have very many presidencies post World War II. You know, the, when people talk about the fundamentals that, you know, the political scientists run their models and they talk about the fundamentals that matter, you know, one of the, the major things is the direction of the economy in the six months before the election. So, You know, the current economy is not as great as we would certainly like it to be, but, you know, unemployment is on its way down. Uh, Wages are finally beginning to tick back up a little bit. If these, you know, trends, you know, economic growth is, again, not as high as we would like it to be, but it's still in positive territory in the, you know, two, two and a half, three percent range. Um, If those trends continue, I find it very hard to see that she would be beaten. And another thing about, you know, the Obama coalition I want you to prove to me that uh, people aren't going to turn out at the same rates. Uh, black voter turnout was not a whole lot higher as a percentage of eligible black voters uh, in 08 and 2012 uh, compared with the Clinton years or even the Bush years. Um, they did turn out, uh, black voters did turn out at a slightly higher rate, but not an enormously higher rate. And again, remember that more than half of black voters are also women who may well turn out at a very high rate for Hillary Clinton. I saw it in my neighborhood during the um, 2008 primary. I live in a very multi-ethnic part of D.C. called Mount Pleasant, uh, which is about a quarter Salvadoran. And during, even though Obama was destined to win, and everyone knew it, Obama was going to win the D.C. primary since the electorate is at least half black here. Um, middle-aged Latino women were out in the streets waving signs, flagging down cars. You know, you could feel the enthusiasm that. Uh, women had for Hillary Clinton, even in uh, an election they knew they were going to lose. Um, So I I don't, you know, we're three guys talking about this, and I think we might be missing, you know, a major dynamic out there. All right. And, uh, you know, fair enough as far as the uh, post-World War II data set. I'm going back to the 19th century here. But, yeah, some of those uh, uh, cycles may not be as uh, applicable to now, uh, we, we can't wrap this up without uh, getting into, again, what has been one of the bigger uh, issues thus far, if not the biggest one in the Republican race. Again, I think thanks largely to Rand Paul, who kind of stands out on this. Lloyd, I'll start with you on sure. this. Rand Paul, I think, w- with preaching realism, a return to, let's say, the George H.W. Bush foreign policy, the days when Jim Baker was Secretary of State. Oh, God. Those days. Well, oh, you know, Jim Baker. It's, it's, well, look, you know. That was a pretty good foreign policy for those four years, general kind of restraint. When we did go to war, we put together an actual coalition, not the faux one that George W. put together. Uh, We we didn't go looking for trouble, as as Republicans seem to want to do now. So 
it, it seems to me Rand Paul is probably closer to the mainstream on this, but maybe, you know, pessimistically from my point of view, out of the mainstream of the Republican Party, which just seems militaristic. What say you? I think the party is not as militaristic as it once was, but I don't think it's as uh, let's bury our head in the sand, isolationist, as perhaps Mr. Paul would like. I, I do think there's a happy middle here. Uh, I I don't know. So it's, it's a tough answer. Where, as you said, about where's the tipping point? I don't have an answer to that. Uh, so, the, but I have to tell you, I don't think Hillary as is as inexorable uh, that her election is is a certainty as much as as Colin would think. She can be polarizing, however. The one issue where Republicans should not bother with. This is funny. It's going to go against Fox News Orthodox here. Americans don't care about Benghazi. If you're going to be, the more you talk about Benghazi, you're tuning off other issues where you, where she might be more vulnerable. Uh, and I, agree. I think that's that. That would be again. That'll be interesting to see what happens. Rick, I've got to ask you a question. I know this is going to sound like being flip or being nasty to, to sure. Rand Paul, but I, I call it the Saturday Night Live factor. And okay. I, I have to I have to ask this question because we saw what happened with Sarah Palin and Tina Fey. I know we're going to chuckle on this, but I have to bring it up. Uh, I do believe that Rand Paul wears a hairpiece, and I know that in politics, that's, you know, <laughs> but but it's easy. Can you see people making fun of it? And that suddenly bec- becomes a story in itself. We've not had an American president wearing it that's worn a hairpiece. I know that sounds comical, but I'm being dead serious on this. Can that can that actually be a factor where people start making fun of that? Could be. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I don't dismiss that. But uh, suppose he's even saying now he cuts his own hair. I, I think that he would, uh, if it got to be a big enough story, I think he would do whatever he could to prove it's his hair, if indeed it is. And, and I, do I mean, I don't think care. It's well. just, look, I, think, I don't you just wonder. That. I call the Senate live factor where suddenly you see people wearing bad toupees and skits pretending to be Rand Paul. We've seen how what what uh, Chevy Chase did to, Jerry, to Gerald Ford in 76. That's why I can't just dismiss that. I, I no, I don't dismiss that at all. I, I'm laughing at the idea it's a hairpiece, but no, 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 no. You're right. You're absolutely right. If it is, it could be an issue. In our remaining moments here, Colin, I want to get a, a follow-up from you. Uh, foreign policy-wise, again, uh, the Middle East is ablaze. Things are not in good mm-hmm. shape. But, uh, again, some of the prescriptions out there for just dumping more arms in willy-nilly ground troops from the likes of George Pataki, what is it going to be like for a Republican to try to navigate the minefield of how you fix the Middle East? That's a tough one. You know, I wonder why we think it's our job to fix the Middle East, to be completely honest. There may be some, uh, in, uh, in the broader American public, there may be some sentiment that Paul can tap into. I don't know if he can in the current Republican primary electorate, though. About the hairpiece, I will point out that this, the, the Saturday Night Live kind of parodies that catch on do so because they capture something that people see in the candidate. If people, mm-hmm. like uh, the I can see Russia from my house, get that sense that Sarah Palin was not prepared. You know, if there were, were a sense that Rand Paul was somehow insincere and fake, the hairpiece thing might not work. Remember, um, uh, Joe Biden, uh, is, you know, he was – he lost his hair in his 30s. That is, uh, you know, that is uh, an operation that restored his princely mane, you know. But, uh, but to get back to the foreign policy thing, it's also going to be tough to outmuscle Hillary Clinton on this. And I will say, I mean, I don't think anything is ever inevitable in politics. I just think she is a very formidable candidate. You know, she did not run a terribly good campaign in 2008. She has surrounded herself, at least on the digital side, the people that are working for her are extremely smart and extremely experienced. They're not going to make the same mistakes they made in 2008. They may make different ones, but I don't think they'll make the same mistakes. But she is, when it comes to foreign policy, she is far more hawkish than I think the Democratic primary electorate is. And it's going to be hard to outmuscle her on that front. Well, and, and maybe more so than Rand Paul, which would be a very interesting uh, dynamic in the general election if that were to be the, uh, the case. Uh, that, that could really redraw lines in kind of a uh, startling kind of a way. Before we uh, wrap up, uh, I want to put you on the spot here, uh, Colin, by mentioning this on air, but uh, something I had had in, in, in mind for uh, a nice, uh, I'll say two-part segment. I don't think we could really do this in one, but uh, I would love to do a state of the left, state of the right, heading into this presidential election, just kind of do a breakdown on it and how you, how you not so much candidates even, but how you say, although some of them like Rand Paul are going to play into it, Bernie Sanders, whatever, but I'd love to do something like that with you and just kind of, you know, see how things have evolved really over the last several years, how they look going into this. So I would hope to be able mm-hmm. to uh, get something going with you on that. I think that could be a lot of fun. 
So that would be great. I'd love to talk about that. That would be great. Yeah, an all-purpose kind of a thing. But uh, this one today, uh, this uh, this was a big success uh, doing this with you guys. Uh, it was awesome. I want to thank you both for being on. Uh, Lloyd, it's the first time I think we've uh, thrown you into the uh, political mix. I, I've talked so many different subjects with you on the show. Uh, we, we checked this one off there uh, as well. And Colin, it's always a lot of fun having you on uh, doing this as well. So thank you both. Uh, this was an awesome segment. Thanks to you guys. My pleasure, Rick. A real, real pleasure. Thanks so much for having us. Excellent. What a great discussion with you fellows. Thank you so much. Thank you all, everybody, for tuning in to FDH Lounge mini episode number 566. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio. Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements.